Okay, good evening, everyone. Letting everyone into the room. My name is Amanda Sutton. I'm the Events and Marketing Director for Bookworks. We're your 36-year-old independent bookstore located in the North Valley of Albuquerque, right there on Rio Grande Boulevard. We share our business space with several local businesses and want to encourage you tonight and always to shop local. Thank you for being with us. This is virtual event around number 105 of the pandemic for me from my virtual office here in Victory Hills, Albuquerque. We're tuning in tonight with Jude Joppy Block and Terry Green Sterling. They have a new book out on one of the villains of the West, Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Arizona. They're gonna be talking about their book, Driving Wild Brown. And they'll be in conversation with one of our friends and customers, Russell Contreras. Thank you all for being here. Hopefully we will learn some things and I think it's going to be an intriguing conversation nonetheless. If you have any questions that come up for you, you can type those into the chat and we will attend to them at the end. All right, let me tell you a little bit about our speakers tonight. Tuning in from the Phoenix area, Terry Green Sterling. She is affiliated faculty and writer in residence at the prestigious Walter Cronkite School at the University, Arizona State University School of Journalism. She is the author of the book, Illegal. Her work has been featured in many national publications, including the Washington Post, the Rolling Stone, Newsweek, Village Voice, on and on. She is the editor at large for the Arizona Center for Investigative Reporting. All right, then we've got Jude Joppy Block. She is an AP person, just like Russell Contreras was before his term at Axios. All right, Associated Press reporter and editor. Before that, she has reported for NPR, The Guardian, The World, and also the Arizona Center for Investigative Reporting. She is a, was a visiting journalist at the Russell Sage Foundation and a fellow with New America, the Center for the Future of Arizona and the Logan Nonfiction Program while she was writing this book. She began her journalism career in Mexico. And then we've got Russell Contreras who will be grilling these two ladies about this topic. He's over at Axios now after a long career at the Associated Press. And we are very pleased to know that he is working on that book about JFK. We can't wait for it to come out so we can have him back for an event. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm going to unpin myself so I can drop some links in the chat for you. And I look forward to hearing more about your book, Driving Wild Brown. Welcome Jude Joppy Block and Terry Green Sterling and Russell. Thanks, uh, thank you for Bookworks for having uh, us. We look forward to this conversation. Before we go into the book, uh, and let me have Terry and Jude talk about its creation and what happened. Uh, Jude, can you show us a quick uh, presentation about the book to get everybody up to speed about what this project is about, how it came, how you guys constructed it, and what came, how did it uh, develop over time? Absolutely, thank you. And here we go with this multimedia presentation. Well, hi, um, I'm Terry Green Sterling, and um, I just want to say hi to my cousin John and my cousin Carmen, who I see in the audience. Um, so good to see you. Um, I come from a borderlands family uh, in the Arizona Sonora borderlands, and I have spent uh, about 40 years of my journalism career, the entire career, writing about the people, places, and um, politics of the border. Um, in this capacity, I have interviewed um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio for many years uh, for newspapers and magazines uh, for a previous book and now for this book. And I'm super happy to um, offer my thoughts and my insights based on these years of reporting. And hello, I am Jude Jaffe Block, and I started covering former Sheriff Joe Arpaio in 2012. And back then I was a public radio reporter. And our book draws on about 30 interviews that we did with Arpaio over the years, as well as interviews with 100 other people who opposed him, supported him, or factored into the story in another way, plus thousands of pages of records. And as a journalist, I won't be sharing my opinion today, just reporting and analysis. 
So what's this book about? Okay, at a granular level, this is a book about a powerful Arizona sheriff known throughout the world for his immigration crackdowns. Um, and so because he's known to retaliate against his critics, few want to stop him and he's sort of uh, operating unchecked. Um, the system of checks and balances breaks down in Arizona, but a Latino resistance rises up against our pile at very great risk. Um, and they also uh, rise up against the laws in Arizona, the state laws that are being passed um, that are intended to criminalize and, and uh, deport immigrants. Um, this is a book um, at a macro level about a battle for American identity and constitutional rights in a time really of reckoning and demographic change. Um, so. And we titled our book Driving While Brown because of the history of people of Mexican descent in Arizona feeling targeted by immigration themed traffic stops. And this is Danny Ortega, who was born in this country. And he explained to us how some of the earlier attacks on immigrants, even long before Sheriff Arpaio, felt like an attack on him too. And he was a young man in the 1970s when Peoria Police Department, which is a suburb outside of Phoenix, began targeting farm workers in traffic stops to check their papers. So let's take a listen to Danny talking about that memory. People were being stopped because they were brown, driving more brown, okay? And so we saw this not only as an attack on the undocumented community, but we saw it as an attack on us simply because of the features of our skin and our hair color and our language. Let's uh, turn our attention once again back to Joe Arpaio. Uh, who is this guy? Well, just very briefly, he's the son of an unwanted immigrant um, who becomes the bane of unwanted immigrants. Uh, he spends 20 years in federal drug enforcement where he develops some traits that will inform his um, activities as sheriff of Maricopa County. Among these traits um, are yearning for media coverage uh, a fondness for conspiracy theories that um, prove his point of view or um, seem to rationalize his actions, and um, a knack really for developing fictional characters uh, to do undercover work. He uh, retired in Phoenix and he ran for sheriff in 1992. Here he created uh, a new persona, uh, America's Toughest Sheriff. In the early 2000s, um, oh, there we go. Jude, is that me or you? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. In the early 2000s, um, a movement starts um, building in Arizona to restrict and punish all unauthorized immigration uh, from Mexico and Central America. Not so much from Canada, by the way. Arpaio does not initially embrace that cause but he pivots in 2006 after he sees it's popular with his base. And in 2007, he signs up for a federal partnership to enforce immigration laws. And in the past, only federal agents could arrest immigrants for being undocumented, which is technically a civil violation, not a criminal one. But Arpaio uh, sought to change that. Oops, we're gonna take a listen to him from a press conference. My program, my philosophy is a pure program. You go after illegals, I'm not afraid to say that. And you go after them and you lock them up. And Arpaio soon starts massive neighborhood sweeps as part of this immigration enforcement. He, his deputies pull over cars for minor traffic violations like cracked windshields, broken taillights, and suspected undocumented immigrants were turned over to ICE and uh, Latino drivers and passengers felt like they too were being targeted. 
And this is a scene from the documentary Two Americans that shows footage from one of those neighborhood sweeps. Solamente su nombre, no coopere, no coopere. Es solamente su nombre. Tiene el derecho a un abogado. I mean, there was no reason to pull me over at all. There was no reason. I wasn't a speed. I didn't do any violation. I think it's the way I look. I look Hispanic, and I am Hispanic. Joven, tiene el derecho a un abogado. No sea intimidado. Le van a preguntar por dónde entró, con quién entró, en dónde vive, dónde está su esposa. No conteste. You stop cars for having broken windshields and burnt out tail lights. Explain how that is law enforcement. Explain that Arpaio. Explain how that makes you a tough sheriff in America. We are under attack. No firmas! No firmas! No firmas! No contestes tu nombre! No contestes tu nombre! Eso es lo que quiero que sepan. Y a todas las familias que se cuiden porque esto parece un infierno. Arizona se está convirtiendo en un infierno para los hispanos. Los van a querer intimidar. Los van a querer intimidar. Pidan por un abogado. And what you see in this clip are um, some of the activists that are featured in the book. Um, Alfredo Gutierrez, who is shouting into the megaphone to arrestees to ask for a lawyer to not sign anything in case they sign away a voluntary deportation order. Um, you also saw um, Salvador Reza and Antonio Bustamante, all who are um, featured in the book. Oops. And there was another tactic that Arpaio used as well, which are worksite raids. And this is a photo of one of those where Arpaio's deputies would go to businesses and arrest immigrant workers who did not have proper authorization to work in the United States. So who, who joins this movement to stop Arpaio? Um, Indigenous folks, day laborers, um, immigrants, their children, um, allies of the movement who are non-Latino and non-Indigenous, non uh, Mexican-Americans, older Chicanos, Latinx activists, um, they all join the resistance to our pile. So this is Carlos Garcia, and he is a, a key character in our book. And he, he grew up he, uh, being an undocumented immigrant in the United States and comes from a mixed status family. And um, he was a genius at creating uh, actions, uh, street actions and other demonstrations that really kept the, um, the idea and the outrage in the hearts and souls of um, not only the movement, but also um, those who were watching it, those outsiders. Okay, um, this is Lydia Guzman. Um, Lydia uh, is another key character in our book. Um, and we hear from readers that she is um, very inspiring to them and has inspired them into activism. Uh, she ramps up her activism as our pile ramps up his enforcement. Uh, she's motivated by the terror. You saw a little bit of the terror in that film clip. She saw it every day. Um, she takes down the names and contact information um, of, of victims and witnesses as potential plaintiffs um, in a very famous racial profiling lawsuit, a class action suit against our pile and his agency. Uh, the case is called Melendres v. Arpaio. And in 2012, that case goes to trial and the plaintiffs um, have to prove that Arpaio's tactics discriminated against Latino drivers and passengers. 
So on the witness stand, um, this guy, this, this man known all around the world for his bravado and um, take no prisoners attitude, when he gets on the stand, um, he presents as a tired sort of confused old man um, and he repeatedly denies wrongdoing. A federal judge finds Arpaio's tactics unconstitutional and orders sweeping reforms to prevent profiling. And the judge uh, permanently bars Arpaio from arresting immigrants who have not committed any crimes. Um, later, the judge learns that Arpaio ignored that court order. And members of the Latino-led resistance push for Arpaio to be punished and prosecuted for criminal contempt of court. And this is Viridiana Hernandez, uh, an activist. Arrest Arpaio. He has done enough crime. He has done enough suffering. He has, he has done enough pain. And our community will not take it anymore. So um, amid all these legal troubles, uh, we have a new, a new character who enters our book, a new, a new person, and that is Donald Trump. Um, Arpaio endorses Donald Trump really early in the election and, and from that moment on sort of fawns over him, calls him his hero. Um, Trump sees that Arpaio's tactics have been popular with um, a certain element of the white base that uh, Trump also needs to court in order to win, um, to win the election. Activists, uh, as well as everybody else uh, who follows this, see a striking similarity between Trump and Arpaio. And they start calling Donald Trump the national Arpaio. And many of the activists who'd been battling Arpaio for years launch a campaign called Basta Arpaio to get him out of office in 2016 and they mobilized voters of color who did not have a history of voting. After um, 24 years in 24 years in office in Arizona, if you can believe that, um, Arpaio loses his reelection bid. Um, many voters, uh, thanks to the work of the resistance, um, many voters now see Arpaio um, as a ruthless civil rights violator or as a symbol of white supremacy or simply as an old man who is an expensive embarrassment to Arizona. All of this means the resistance has prevailed but there's so much more work to be done. Um, they set their sights, the resistance sets its sights on Arpaio-like policies in the jails and other discriminatory law enforcement practices on the streets. After a criminal trial, um, Arpaio is found guilty of contempt of court. But before Arpaio is sentenced, guess who comes in to rescue him? Donald Trump, now president, rescues Arpaio with his first presidential pardon. And there's an immediate backlash to the pardon. There's heavy criticism of Trump's decision. And we met with Arpaio after the pardon and he shared his reaction to that backlash. I got two new titles now. The disgraced sheriff, that's everywhere. Disgraced sheriff. And the other one is racist. So I got two new titles. I lost my America's toughest sheriff title. And Arpaio later tries running for office again, but he's not successful. And the grassroots efforts to mobilize voters of color in Arizona continues. And this is Maria Castro, um, a activist in her 20s who had started walking neighborhoods trying to mobilize voters when she was in high school, starting back in 2011. And she told us in 2020, that was the year that she saw voters the most excited to participate that she'd ever seen. And um, that excitement is one reason why Arizona turned blue in the 2020 presidential election. And she told us, I think the defeat of Joe Arpaio made it tangible that we can defeat the villains that haunt our dreams. That was her referring to that 2016 defeat. Okay, and so that uh, wraps up our presentation.
Thank you guys. We appreciate that. And for giving us the overview of the book, before we get into the research and the writing process, take us back to Joe Arparo in Springfield, Massachusetts. He is a product of an Italian immigrant in an Italian American community that is, has strong immigrant ties. What happens to his father and mother and what happens to him as a child? Well, he's, uh, his father is a uh, immigrant, an unwanted immigrant. Um, at the time that his father came to the United States in 1923, the eugenicists had a strong influence on immigration law. And they believed that the white race was, the white Northern European race should not be polluted. And, and they viewed um, other, other Europeans even as, uh, you know, possible polluters or mongrelizers of their race. So they didn't want them in. There were strict quotas. Arpaio's dad is a Southern Italian, was kind of on the low end of, of desirability. And um, he, he, uh, he made it in, barely. And Arpaio grew up with uh, the kind of, uh, hearing the kind of rhetoric that uh, his fans would later uh, use on, on Latino immigrants. Um, Arpaio's mom dies early. Arpaio then uh, uh, goes, he disappoints his dad by not going to college and he goes into the DEA. He's in the DEA for 20 years. And then he goes to Arizona and runs for sheriff. Or he's already in Arizona. He retires there, runs for sheriff. And Jude, what did you find out about his career in the DEA? This is the Drug Enforcement Administration created during the Nixon administration. He becomes some sort of figure uh, um, in with President Nixon. What did you guys find in his career? And how did Nixon see this young uh, upstart from Springfield, Massachusetts? Yeah, well, I'm actually I'm going to let Terry take that one because she did um, she did most of the reporting on this phase of his life. So, um, as I mentioned in the intro, Arpaio learned some things in the DEA that later inform his activities as sheriff. Um, the, you know, very briefly, the first one is wanting to get you know yearning, craving uh, to to be in the media. Um, the second is creating fictional characters to go undercover and jumping into those characters. Um, and uh, the th one, of the, one of the really important ones that I didn't mention um, was during the Nixon administration, uh, Nixon, there was a um, primary election coming up and Nixon was very concerned that Republicans were gonna lose. It was a midterm election. And uh, so he, he decided, um, at that, at that time that they were gonna have a border blockade because there was a lot of uh, propaganda about, uh, you know, the dangers of marijuana is a gateway drug and, you know, the, the pot came from Mexico. So they were gonna stop everyone. They were gonna blockade the entire border, which they did. And they stopped everyone coming into the United States from Mexico. And they did, um, they strip searched some people and um, they uh, actually would take women, at the time there were beehive hairdos and they would take, you know, go through women's beehive hairdos to see, you know, look for drugs. Um, there was so much coverage and it created such a hue and cry um, that Arpaio learned very early from that experience that the border, uh, you know, border politics gets uh, gets the base energized. So there was that. And we want to remind our um, people watching this, we do have a link in our chat where you can buy the book from bookworks.com. Um, please go there and support your local bookstore. Um, they will ship it to you right there to your doorstep. Jude, um, thing that you and I had, had covered with the AP would come up con consistently when he moves from the DEA and becomes the sheriff, he be develops into this caricature of himself. A lot of it is media driven, calls himself the toughest, toughest sheriff in America, America's toughest sheriff. But he, you guys mentioned that he develops quote unquote fictional characters. Who are these characters and what purpose do they serve? Well, the, that comes from his time in the DEA that roots back to that when he was, he would actually go undercover. And so he had 
personas where um, as an Italian American, he would sometimes pretend to would try to infiltrate mafia organizations and play a character in order to do an undercover bust. Um, and we uh, spoke with one of his former partners in the DEA who said that, you know, that Joe Arpaio was very good at, at that role um, of going undercover and creating personas that were believable. Um, and then, you know, as you mentioned, really his, his most important role of all is this persona of a Western tough sheriff. And it, it makes him um, nationally relevant as early as the 90s for being tough on his jail inmates for things like um, he gets a lot of attention for putting them in black and white uniforms, for making them sleep in outdoor tents, for making them wear pink underwear, um, for eating very unappetizing food, um, these different uh, conditions. And so um, that uh, creates this national brand. And then in the mid 2000s, when he pivots to immigration enforcement, it's another persona. It's the really tough on immigrants border hawk who is regularly invited to speak on cable news about immigration themes. And from there, he's able to develop a national fundraising base of people all over the country who are worried about illegal immigration, who donate to him as a local county sheriff. He, he makes he's able to um, fundraise incredibly um, millions and millions of dollars for a local race from donors all over the country who see him as um, as somebody who can protect the country from from the immigration that they fear. Okay. At the same time, this is going on where he's developing, he's turning into this caricature, he's transforming into this national figure. Arizona itself is going through its own transformation you talked a little bit about Lydia Guzman and the development of the Latino resistance. Now, let's be clear, Arizona is the last state amongst New Mexico, Texas, California, that is getting a politicized Latino vote in bigger numbers where they can affect elections. But talk a little bit about Lydia Guzman and what happens by the resistance. When does it develop and when does it strengthen? Um, well, I mean, I think what a pivotal moment for the Latino resistance really comes up in, I mean, what we see are these dual movements really happening at the same time. So there's what we call a restrictionist movement in Arizona, which is the movement to restrict immigration, to criminalize immigrants, to um, make sure that uh, unauthorized immigrants don't have access to different public programs and things like that. That movement starts uh, starts rising um, and in the early 2000s and 2004 is a pivotal moment and the resistance starts responding to that and then a big key year is 2006 that's when we see immigrant rights marches all over the country um, and Phoenix had a really big one but but Phoenix didn't used to have a coalition of of people organized around immigrant issues until really that 2006 March. And that coalition that organizes the March ends up staying in touch to organize around other issues. And it becomes um, a place where there is an effort to, out of that coalition comes the effort to stop our pile. And it also ends up being an umbrella organization and, and spawning other organizations that are dedicated to um, increasing the Latino vote in Arizona as well. And so we see these, what, what eventually happens in the case of Arizona is that you have SB 1070 and various uh, strict immigration laws being passed. Um, and you have new activists being inspired to, to get involved in reaction to that. And then you have Arpaio doing his enforcement as we've discussed. And so this resistance ends up happening on, on many levels. So there's the registering voters and getting out the vote. There's uh, court cases to, to sue over various laws and to sue Arpaio over his policies. Um, and then there's trying to kind of tell a different narrative and win the, the public debate by um, telling stories and reaching out to media and getting a different point of view across in the public square. Um, and so we see all of these, and then there's uh, street actions as well. There's civil disobedience, there's marches, there's very visible, um, 
iconic kind of uh, like a protest balloon of our pile emerges that that ends up being um, part of this reshaping of the narrative. And so uh, we see all of these different tactics that the, the resistance uses over time. And it really kind of culminates in 2016 and in 2020. And Terry, while this is going on, there's also um, politicians who are speaking out, um, not who are not part of the immigrant rights movement, who were um, critiquing his tactics as a law enforcement officer, as a, as a county official, but yet then they faced a backlash from his office and his deputies. Talk about what happens with the Phoenix mayor, for example, or other people that speak out. How are they intimidated and what happens there? Okay, um, bef before, I'd love to answer that question, but before that, I just have to share one thing, which is that um, one character that our pile, you asked what kind of characters did he assume, fictional characters. My, my favorite DEA drug enforcement character that he assumed is um, one of a pimp uh, who had junkie whores. And so he would go underground and uh, assume this persona of the pimp with the whores and, and tell the drug dealers that he wanted to buy, um, he wanted to buy drugs for his whores. So that was one that he played very convincingly according to his partner. Um, so getting back um, to uh, what, it, what was widely viewed in Arizona as retaliation um, against critics, um, when, when Arpaio faced criticism from powerful people, he, um, on occasion, he did two things. First of all, many, many people told us in the book that um, when they, uh, you know, confronted Arpaio about something, uh, the next thing they knew, they would be tailed by cop cars, they would be, uh, cop cars would be outside, you know, their, their homes parked there, you know, embarrassing them in front of the neighbors parked there for hours and hours and hours. And they viewed that as retaliation. Um, but for some of the more powerful people, um, our pile would launch investigations. Uh, very often based on conspiracy theories, which once again takes us back to the DEA days and the conspiracy theories. Um, and um, often these investigations were found to be without merit, but they could be career ruining because of the publicity. Um, the Phoenix mayor uh, was, you know, spoke out very early against our pile um, and uh, sought a federal investigation of our pile. And the next thing he knew he was being investigated um, for, for you know, something that was not true and was very embarrassing to him. So uh, people just, you know, power brokers just didn't want to, you know, didn't want to touch him because this happened again and again. There was also a judge who, um, who was investigated and falsely indicted and that ruined his career. And the judge had simply said, please get the prisoners, uh, the jail inmates to the courts on time. And um, are you using the escorts from the jails to the courts uh, for something else? Because the prisoners aren't getting to us, the inmates aren't getting to court on time, if at all. And um, are you using this, the judge asked, are you using these resources for immigration enforcement? And that launched a conspiracy theory based investigation and false indictment. Jude, as you mentioned in the book, um, we get into, it's not a shock that he loses in 2016 after, um, during the, the election of Donald Trump. But there was attempts before that to kick him out of office. Why did it take so long for the resistance to form to get enough votes in Maricopa County to finally defeat him? What were the obstacles? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, as the years went by, his margin of victory got narrower and narrower. I think it's important to preface this by pointing out, though, that at one point in time, he was easily the most popular politician in Arizona. Um, so his at at his height, I mean, he he really couldn't have had better poll numbers. Um, by by the 2012 election, 
he only won by a by in single digits it was like five points um and uh it, it, it was really his opponent was in striking distance there were two opponents that year who kind of split the the difference um and i think that one of the things that hadn't happened yet at the time of that election was that the judge had not issued his ruling in the racial profiling lawsuit there had been a trial but no verdict so there was controversy but no ruling and what happened after in the in the years that followed it came out that that our pio that a federal judge had uh violated constitutional rights um had uh and that it was going to cost county taxpayers millions and millions of dollars and then it also came out that that uh the sheriff's office had not followed all of court order all of the court's orders and this was going to spur yet more county taxpayer resources to get to the bottom of it through a contempt of court case and so that that allowed in 2016 there to be uh, another reason to get rid of him um, that was pretty convincing to people on both sides of the aisle, which was that he was very expensive um, and that he was costing a lot of money. So anyone who hadn't been convinced in 2012 before there was a ruling now had a ruling of racial profiling and a, a very high uh, expensive taxpayer bill. So this seemed to be uh, a factor. I mean, also he he was getting older and older as time went on. But it was a very interesting um, juxtaposition because on the one hand, in 2016, Arpaio was endorsing Donald Trump and was stumping for him um, at his rallies and was appeared on the the Republican National Convention stage to endorse Trump and yet lost his own local election. And Terry, you uh, you guys mentioned earlier as you showed us. And you mentioned in the book when he goes on the stand in his trial, he then adopts another persona as the lost older guy who is kind of confused, doesn't know what's going on. It reminded me of Ronald Reagan in his last years where I just don't remember. I just don't remember um, what happens after he loses. What kind of persona does he try to adopt as he attempts to to bring a, a almost a, a tragic figure to us to kind of he doesn't get the immediate attention but he wants people to feel sorry for him oh i'm just trying to i was doing what i thought was right so forth and so on what happens to him then well i think uh you know he has this conspiracy theory um and he's believed in a long time that um you know liberal forces were out to bring him down because he was enforcing immigration um, you know, the usual, the usual suspects, George Soros and, you know, um, Barack Obama and Obama holdovers. And um, so he becomes, I think, um, I think he wanted to become, to continue his career, but, you know, he lost two elections and um, he's pretty marginalized. So it appears that he's, um, Right now, he is the the elder statesman who's been victimized, who is still fighting and will never back down because he still goes, you know, he I think he was going to a California, a group that uh, that, uh, you know, is involved in the California secession and um, you know, he does go to fringe groups is what I'm trying to say, but um, he doesn't have the kind of coverage that he had before. And he will, you know, he always says, I'm not going down. I'm, I'm you know, I'm fighting. I'm fighting to the bitter end. Jude, you, you guys talked a little about his legacy right after he loses. There was, I remember in Trump's in office, there was a lot of Oparo wannabes that come out and they try to be the next toughest lawman, next toughest chairman, uh, chair, um, sheriff. Um, I do remember a few of them that put patches on their arms and then they fade too away. But that legacy in Arizona and in the American Southwest, uh, what kind of legacy did he leave and what kind of damage um, that are, is the resistance trying to address? And by damage, I don't mean it in, a, in an opinion way, but I'm talking about the legal damages that the courts have cited. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that the, the court case 
uh, Melendra's VR Pio that we talked about that really started in 2007. Um, it is 2021, that case is still going. Um, so uh, the, the new sheriff, uh, Paul Penzone, who's a Democrat who won re-election this last election, um, he's inherited that court case. And he, he's also inherited some of the debate about what the role of local law enforcement should be in immigration enforcement, which, I mean, I think that the Arpaio case study stood out as basically what many immigrant rights advocates could hold up as the worst case scenario for what happens if you empower local law enforcement to do immigration enforcement. So basically that you have a violation of constitutional rights of both immigrants and uh, US citizens. And you also have a situation where you have a Latino community who, whose um, public safety needs aren't being met. Um, one part of the story that we haven't gotten into is that under Arpaio's watch, um, other journalists were able to expose that there were sex crimes that went uninvestigated um, while his office was was very adamantly focused on immigration enforcement. And um, Lydia Guzman was answering hotline phone calls for a private hotline she'd set up to help immigrants, many of whom were too afraid to go to regular law enforcement for fear that it would lead to deportation or uh, of themselves or a loved one. So when immigrant rights advocates talk about the dangers of empowering uh, local law enforcement to do this job, they are now able to point to the Arpaio example. Um, and we, we saw even towards the end of the Obama administration, um, many local uh, uh, jurisdictions protesting um, having immigration enforcement be anywhere close to the, the, the jails or to the role of, of local police. And we saw um, some, some places really put pressure on local government to end cooperation agreements with ICE. And that was something that the Trump administration fought, tried to deny funding to those places that were, which he called sanctuary cities. Um, and that was its own controversy. And so I think that this is one part of the legacy is, is creating an example that others can point to of what can go wrong. Now, in the case of Maricopa County, uh, Paul Penzone uh, has not completely backtracked Arpaio's uh, immigration enforcement in every single way. For example, at one point he said that ICE would no longer be allowed in the jails to pick up arrestees who were undocumented, um, but he did walk that back and now they can, there is a coordinated handoff that happens. So if you are undocumented, you're arrested, um, you could be handed off to ICE to enter deportation proceedings upon release from jail. The same forces that were trying to get rid of Arpaio and helped elect Penzone very much wanted that nexus to end. Um, there are some reasons that make it complicated in Arizona law. Uh, SB 1070 says, for example, you can't have sanctuary cities um, in Arizona. Um, so there are interesting legal qu questions that bring up, but there is a lot of disappointment among those who were involved in ousting Arpaio that, that that local immigration connection still exists in Maricopa County, as it does in many parts of the, of the country, though perhaps not to the same extent that it did um, a few years ago. And Terry, the whole concept of, of uh, Aparo-ism is still around. One could point to um, the audit of Maricopa County at the election there. How are folks who former supporters continuing some of his objectives, you know, I mean, objectives in, in a broad term of enforcement of nationalism, of white supremacy, whatever you want to call it? What's going on today in Maricopa County with some of his supporters? Okay. Um, well, his supporters, uh, you, you see some of the same faces in, in the audit, Maricopa County audit. For those of you who don't know, and I'm sure everyone knows, um, we're having a, a very controversial audit of, of votes in Maricopa County based on the conspiracy theory that Trump won, won the election. Um, we're sort of ground zero right now for, um, for the big lie. Uh, that's what many believe. Anyway, um, some of his supporters uh, you see 
uh, rising, demonstrating in favor of the audit. You see the same folks there. And um, it has been said by many people that um, the, the audit is a way to um, cement Republican votes um, and to you know, cast questions, um, to cast doubt on the electoral process. That's the audit. But um, there are other things going on in the Arizona legislature um, that, that are you know, intended, I think, that are criticized for um, wanting to uh, keep people of color and low-income people from voting, making it more difficult for, the, for them to vote. So there are two things going on. The, the audit of the 2020 vote in Maricopa County is going on. And then over at the legislature, there are proposed laws um, that are viewed as voter suppression laws. And that all ties, Jude? Yeah, well, to... I didn't mean to interrupt you midstream, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I just did want to note that um, that some of the same uh, members of the Latino-led movement that were organizing against Arpaio have now come, are, are involved in lobbying against some of the voter suppression uh, or the, the strict voting rules um, that, that many believe would lead to the voter suppression that's happening at the, at the state legislature level. So groups like Lucha that were involved in, in mobilizing voters of color are also involved in legislative fights as, a, as is the ACLU of Arizona, which was involved in, in suing Arpaio over Melendrez. So, so we're seeing some of the, some of the same uh, some of the same figures who were involved in this earlier fight um, transitioning to election issues. And we'd like to remind our, um, those who are with us today to please put your questions in the box. Um, and we'd love to have you. We want this to be an interactive thing with our authors. Thank you, um, Jude and Terry. Um, question about the process. You guys both were working for different organizations at the time when you met covering Aparo. When did you guys decide, let's team up and try to come up with a project, a book here on Aparo? A lot of have been written about him in newspapers, magazines, but we hadn't had a comprehensive book at looking at him. What drove both of you to jump in this project together? Do you, do you want to take that? Sure. Well, I mean, for me, I got to, I got, I started covering Phoenix in 2012. And my first big assignment uh, as a public radio reporter in Phoenix was to cover the Melendrez trial. And it instantly became, it, to me, it felt like I was watching the front lines of a, of a really important civil rights battle that, that people did not know about uh, or did not know in depth enough. And in my three to four minute public radio stories could never do justice to put the whole thing in, in its historical context. Um, even the historical context of 10 years earlier, you know, gets left out of those short news stories, much less the context of the entire history of Arizona once being Mexico and all of the tensions that arose from that. And so I, I think um, it felt obvious to me that that somebody needed to put this saga into one volume so that it could be read start to finish. Um, and I was delighted that that uh, Terry had been thinking along those lines already before we even talked about it and that we could partner up. Right, and one of, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted, uh, we wanted to tell this story. Uh, we wanted to report the rep report the story, research the story really thoroughly, but um, tell it tell it as a novel as much as possible. Tell it through um, the hearts and souls of the characters, and we felt that if if you got to know the people in the book, um, you would want to take the journey through the book with them. Um, so yeah, so we, we signed our contract, I think in 2016 and we got to work, we had to work on a piecemeal and then um, different things happened with Trump, but um, we got it, as they say, got her done. Can I just, can I answer one, one question about um, Arpaio-ism? I, saw, I sure. saw in the chat, um, Miguel. So um, I think Arpaio-ism is, um, has, has sort of been, um, has metastasized across, metastasized across the country with Trump. There will, there will always be racism, but um, some, sometimes it is, it rises up in a really ugly way and then it goes back down underground. And um, 
So I think that, that there was a lot of um, permission uh, that Trump gave um, to, to be anti-immigrant, to, to be xenophobic. And I think it's um, quite a problem that is facing the nation right now. Um, but I also think that the Arizona experience is that once, you know, a movement never stops fighting. And um, I think these two forces will be at play for a long, long time. And one of the takeaways about the, the Latino led resistance in Arizona is that they're still fighting, that they don't, you know, they don't, they don't, um, they don't stop because they've won a battle. They mm -hmm. keep fighting because they understand that this is a battle for the heart and soul of America. Now, we're at an interesting time now in the United States, a year after the George Floyd um, death, where there is pressure across the country, local, statewide, federal level, to reform policing. What are the key lessons um, in promoting sheriff reform, law enforcement reform elsewhere that this story could lend uh, when we're looking at, all communities are different, but when a community starts to look at itself, what could what lessons could be drawn by this narrative here? You want to take that, Terry? Oh, I was hoping you'd take it. Um, I th I think what lessons can be drawn. First of all, I think that um, the courts that the courts are very slow, and um, so to to and as I said and as I was telling Miguel, the fight never ends. Um, I think people of privilege often think that you know, if one battle's won, okay, I can go back to my life, but, I, but that's not the way it works. So, th so, th so one of the lessons is um, that resistance is a long game and that um, effective resistance in Arizona, which I think can be modeled elsewhere in the country, um, has to do with um, having a, a diversity of actions. Um, so you go to the courts, the courts are gonna take forever. How do, you keep, how do you keep this in the hearts and souls of the people? How do you keep it in the public square? Well, you have street actions. Um, you have um, demonstrations and those will be covered by the media and that gives voice to those who, who wanna talk. Right, so it keeps it front and center, um, and um, so it's the courts, the streets, the public square, and then of course the all-important voting booth. So the resistance is ongoing, but it is ongoing in all those areas, and I think that's a lesson. And um, one of the things with the book that we hear um, from people who are not, you know, people who are not Latino, um, <clears throat> is how can we help? And um, I think that the resistance, uh, you know, it's, it's unfair to ask um, a community of color to bear the burden for fighting for civil rights for all Americans. And so um, I would say also that those who want to join a resistance anywhere in the United States um, should find where there's, should find some, some institution where their skills are, are valued and that institution, I think, will have intersectionality with a, with a lot of civil rights issues. Those are all lessons I learned. And June, in our final system. moments that we have together, um, talk a little about the writing process. This book, if you grab it, you immediately see it's, it's meticulously researched. You have a number of interviews. You're recreating scenes for us. But as a writer, you were bringing characters out in a nonfiction, novelistic, form. How, what was the writing process like to get that Truun Capote-esque um, writing across that we're reading this book and if we're not careful we immediately think this is a novel, right? This is all factually correct but where the reader is so enthralled in it that you have, you're, we're sitting there, you're telling us a story. What was that process like? Was that intentional or is that like you're reporting just all natural? Um, well, I have Terry to thank for that. Um, Terry has been practicing uh, narrative nonfiction for quite some time. And so for me, I, I, I'm, um, 
I'm somebody who likes to get lost in court documents and poke around and and see what I can find on Pacer and that no one's seen before and that kind of stuff. And so we really um, married our skill sets uh, in this book project. And um, and I'm grateful that I I learned a trick or two about uh, about how to get closer to doing what what you've just described. Um, but yeah, I mean, it took um, it was a new way of thinking coming from public radio. Uh, where you're just trying to um, to kind of get in and get out and tell everybody uh, what happened. In this case, we were trying to bring in sensory detail to put things through the minds of our characters. And it was a, a completely different interview process than I was used to because you had to ask for people's emotion and feeling and also sensory detail to be able to recreate those scenes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it's it's very different than any other kind of reporting that I've done or writing. Um, but um, I hope that it means that it, I think Terry convinced me that the only way that we were going to be able to get people through a book this dense, so full of facts and so full of complex legal and policy issues was to make them care about the people involved. And the only way we could do that was by bringing them in in this way. The book, Driving While Brown, Sheriff of Powell versus the Latino Resistance, available now here at Bookworks. You can click on the link below. It'll be delivered directly to your doorstep. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Jude, for joining us here at Bookworks. We really appreciate it.